I have five panelists here today from very different backgrounds. Um, I'll point out that in your schedule, in your printed schedule, you might have um, Dennis Dye from Southwestern Indian Poly Polytech Institute, but he was unable to make it. Um, as a result, we have <laughs> graciously found uh, someone to uh, fill that spot, uh, James Rattling Leaf. So he's not in your printed program, but um, each speaker will have uh, a few minutes to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about where they're coming from, because everybody here is coming from di very different places. That'll help contextualize what we're going to see. And, um, and here, um, I'll start off with some questions, but we'll open it up broadly to the audience. I also want to reiterate that if folks can make sure that if you are speaking, whether in the audience or up here, to use the microphone, both for the benefit of the folks here, but also for the benefit of the folks who are participating via our live stream. Okay. Uh, first person up. You can stay there, or you can come up and mic. Well, let me. Uh, I'll just go ahead and stand up for five minutes. Uh, good morning. How me daku yapi? Chante washte na pe chizapolo. James Rowling Leaf in Mataha. Na shichango yate. Amachiapi, Ampetukile, Yishka, Upo. In the Lakota language, I greet you with a good heart and a handshake. My name is James Rowlingleaf. I'm from the Rosebud Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. And I wish you all a good day and an encouragement a good day. And as, as a moderator, I mentioned that I, uh, I'm a pitch hitter today, to use a baseball analogy. But, uh, but uh, wow, what a, I'm, I'm still reeling from that last talk. To be honest, uh, where do I start? But wasn't that great? I, uh, I I've never, uh, yeah. I've never heard or seen or been a part of something like that for a long, long time. And uh, it makes me want to get out there <laughs> and march or do something, right? That passion, and that's part of uh, uh, what I wanted to share share with you today. Um, you know, when I when I was thinking about this talk, uh, um, I got the I got the I got the message driving from South Dakota, which where I'm from, and um, I was in Wyoming when Alicia called me, asked me if I could step in, and I said sure. I was willing to to help out, and I thank you all the all the uh, organizers for um, for bringing me in here. Uh, again, I didn't I didn't apply. But circumstances worked out where I, I get to be with you today, and so I want to offer some things to you in, in a good way. Um, Eleven years ago, I was in this building, and I was part of a group called the Seven Generations um, Conference, and it brought American Indian knowledge holders and leaders from around the country and NCAR and UCAR scientists in this building to talk about a changing climate, but also talk about different ways of understanding and knowing the world. And you know, so it brought back a lot of good memories to be here, and to in this building, and you know, premier science organization, and to have the native languages spoke out loud, to have a drum beat, and to have uh, native elders come and share their understanding of the world, but also with with another knowledge system within a Western scientist coming, and in community, and to talk about you know how we deal with a changing climate. And so that's one thing. So, I'm, I, so I think there's, there's something special when we gather together like this and to share what's on our minds and our hearts. I, that's why I appreciate the good doctor talking about not only our mind but our heart. As Native people, we, uh, we consider that and we value that. Uh, my work is in cross-cultural training and understanding. And so I'm in, I live in Rapid City, South Dakota. And so we, if you know that history, of that community in that region. So we, there's a lot of conflict between American Indian and, and non-American Indian people around all kinds of issues. So there are those of us who are what I call boundary warriors, those who can step into that space between these two cultures and try to find a pathway forward in a respectful and honorable way. And I, and I like what she said, there's no good people, not bad people. I really like that. And that's, what, that's where I find myself. And so I work in, with science organizations, I work with tribal governments, tribal colleges, 
uh, mainstream universities as they come to understand how they can work more effectively um, with each other. And so I, I work on something called cultural intelligence framework. And so work that's been developed out of Michigan. I really like it. And so we're beginning to practice that in, in Rapid City, working with the police department, working with the university, and working for a utility company called Black Hills Energy, who actually actually has a footprint here in Colorado. So they asked me to come and help them. And I really want to take back a lot of the things I learned here today. And I think that's our, that's our challenge here today is what, what do we do with all these kind of things? And from the Native American perspective, you know, I, I'm hearing more and more of this land acknowledgement. How many people understand what that means and have heard that before in this audience? So for me, in, in, in another part of my, my role is I started to work with the University of Colorado Boulder. And hearing the, 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 the professor's story about CU Boulder and, and the barriers and, and the trials that she's dealing with, I kind of wonder what I got myself into. <laughs> do I really want to do it? Well, I think that, that speaks to this, you know, what we're trying to do um, at CU Boulder. Um, you know, they're asking me to come and, and work within uh, the institution to help what I would call indigenized academy. That's not my words. It's been used before with other leading Native scholars, indigenize the community, just talk about space, just talk about a place where we can come together and look at these two different knowledge systems. Now, we still are, as Native people and Native nations, we're still wrestling with what happened to us. And when I come and talk to people about these kind of things, it's a very complicated, hard thing. And so I all start with what is and what has been to establish a context of understanding. Never assume that people understand and know who we are. And there's a, there was a study that was done in 2018 on higher educational equity and inclusion and diversity. It was done by a group here in Colorado called American Indian College Fund. And this was really born out of the incident that happened at Colorado State in 2018 where two native men were looking at the college and visiting and walking around. and. And they were, um, the, some lady misunderstood or whatever it was, called the cops on those two young men, and so they had to deal with that. But the university responded by bringing in um, these native leaders to come together to talk about how do, we, how do we go forward from this? How do we move forward? And what do we need to do as an institution? What are we skills and understandings and abilities that we need to grow, to, uh, to grow and to develop? So as Native people, we, we have a culture. 550 plus federal nation, uh, federal recognized tribes in the country yet today. And we're all aspiring for what's something called self-determination and sovereignty. We want to be who we are yet, despite everything that happened to us 500 plus years of, uh, of assimilation and all these different policies. And I think it's the issue of invisibility. She mentioned about invisibility. I love that. She talked about it because sometimes in my work, 25 years, you know, somebody said, well, we, we want this new initiative, and I like this universal design concept. But I'm wondering if, if that's going to happen where it's going to be sort of normal to include American Indian people, American Indian tribal colleges in that planning, in the forefront of that discussions at the table, if you will, and not on the menu, that, you know, we have a contribution to make. We've made a tremendous contribution to this country in land and natural resources. And so that's the question I think that we have in front of us uh, in terms of how we go forward as, a, as tribal nations and tribal colleges and tribal people. You know, we need to think about this deeply and I think events like this are helpful. Again, I'm just one person representing myself and a member of a tribe. So don't take, you know, be, just be careful about how you generalize or overgeneralize my comments and things about it. But, but I think we're, we're, we want to be engaged we want to be a part of the discussion. And I think we can make a contribution to going forward. So climate change is one of the areas that I, I'm involved in and, and helping and, and thinking about and, and bringing young people into discussion, dividing programs so that our students can be successful. But there is a gap. There is a gap in our education for American Indian people yet. And so there are good people working hard on this issue. Uh, there are people here at the university thinking about this wrestling with it because there's really no easy answers. Somebody said there's no silver bullet, but maybe there's a silver buckshot. You know? 
it's it's kind of systemic. So, you know, so so let let so let's put our minds. Sitting, we'll say, let's put our minds together and see what we can do for our children. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Uh, my name is Gina Helfrank. I'm director of communications and culture at. Num Focus, uh, which is a nonprofit that supports open practices in data science and research. Notably, uh, we serve as the legal entity for a number of popular open source projects in data science. Um, I thought I would just talk about sort of a few formative experiences in my own life that have shaped the consciousness that I bring to this work. Um, I was born in Washington, D.C. I grew up uh, in a quite well-off family. We moved to Texas when I started second grade. And uh, the town that I am from is called Lubbock. It's in West Texas. I see some smiles, recognition. <laughs> um, I was also bust when I was in fourth grade, um, which isn't a thing anymore as far as I know, uh, to an el elementary school across town that was predominantly black and Hispanic. Um, and so that was probably my first kind of racial consciousness that, uh, oh wow, I'm, I'm not, I can't just take it for granted that I'm in the majority anymore. Um, so fast way forward, um, most of I think the really key moments of my life happened in graduate school. Um, I left Lovick for college. I went to Boston College on the East Coast, which is a Jesuit Catholic school. I studied philosophy. I thought it was very interesting. I did ask big questions about life. I had some cognitive dissonance about the fact that I was reading like um, basically 100% men <laughs> um, and largely white men in uh, the canon. Uh, nevertheless, I thought it was very interesting. I pursued a philosophy PhD at Emory University. When I was there, I also got a certificate, which is like a minor for PhD students, um, in women's studies. And in the women's studies program at Emory, I encountered some phenomenal students who were um, also who were pursuing the women's studies PhD. Um, if you have heard the term misogynoir, that was coined by Moya Bailey, who I was in graduate school with. So there were just like some really outstanding people um, who I had the privilege of learning from and with. Um, my dissertation was really a combination of things. My focus was in ethics. I was interested in the concept of solidarity. I was trying to think about what does it mean for people to be in solidarity with one another, especially across difference. There was an experience I had. I served on a few president's commissions, one on the status of women, one on LGBTQ people. Um, and there was a celebration, an anniversary celebration for the Women's Commission. Uh, and it was um, designed to be held in an outdoor location one of the organizing people passed another one of the longtime members who used a wheelchair and was like, I'll see you at the celebration later, S like had that moment. And then when it actually came time, the location was not accessible for her. And so the woman was obviously very upset and sort of left in tears. And when I heard about this, I was like, how, how can someone have that interaction? I'll see you there later. And just it doesn't even click. So that was really what I was trying to grapple with um, in my dissertation work, is how do, we, how do we do this work across difference? Uh, then I graduated into the recession, and I <laughs> took <laughs> three part-time jobs. And one of those jobs uh, was teaching intro to Western philosophy at Morehouse College in Atlanta, which is a historically black men's university. Uh, and that was also very formative for me because I thought, okay, now I have to teach 60 black men the history of philosophy. And I already know the version of the history of philosophy that I have been taught, and I cannot responsibly teach that same one to them. So I really had to think about my curriculum. Um, that was very formative. And then uh, my stars sort of aligned, and I was uh, hired on as assistant director at the Harvard College Women's Center. Um, so at Harvard, I worked with amazing students. Um, I was fortunate to work on a committee with Mazarin Banaji, who is a really 
preeminent researcher in unconscious bias. That got me really interested in those kind of questions. So it was like a continuation of the same thought. You know, there are aspects of our minds that are uh, in conflict with our explicit values, and what do we do about that? Um, so after a lot of uh, soul searching, I decided I would move home to Texas, quit Harvard, <laughs> get into technology, um, and through some twists and turns, I wound up at NumFocus. Um, and I also do some work uh, as a consultant on unconscious bias and diversity and inclusion. Hello. How are we doing today? Great. Good, for real? Thank you, thank you. I, um, I was like, man, everybody's like listening so intently. I'm trying to liven up a little bit. So I guess I'm the corporate guy. Um, <laughs> so, no, so, um, so I'm a founder and CEO of Jump Recruits. And so I think the best way to talk about what it is that we do, what I do, I'll give it to you in two stories, and then um, I'll go into very quickly within time um, <laughs> what it is that we do. So the first story, um, I was working with a client, and we just go straight into it. So I was working with a client in the healthcare technology space. And so they're about $1.5 billion, this was last year, um, and they've reached this in 10 years. Uh, so really fast, got up there really quickly. My team was consulting with this organization and helping them with various different things around diversity, HR, oh, there we go, whoa. I don't like the sound of my voice like that, okay. All right. <laughs> So um, my team was consulting with them, and one of the program managers came into the room, um, also a senior leader in the organization. And she comes to me and she says, hey, Cedric, I really want you to meet someone on my team. They're coming from India next week. He knows a lot about what you have going on, and I want you to talk to him, and I want you to work this stuff out to figure out what you do to, to make this successful. I say, sure, great. Can you give me his name? She says, sure. Her exact statement was, his name is um, Mook, Mukhtar, Mook, Mook, Mukesh. Um, I can't remember right now, but that really doesn't matter. And so I cringed. Um, I literally tensed up in the chair because I couldn't believe that someone this high in the organization had that to say in a room of individuals that she didn't, one, she didn't know. Two, she didn't know the door was open, who was listening. And you know, I, I, we always say we always say this in our company is that where you are in one place is where you are everywhere. And so, if this was happening here, then you know what could have happened in other places. And so, not to embarrass her, I let her leave the room. She finished talking. She left the room. I immediately went to talk to her, and we talked about this idea of humanizing individuals. And we talked about it in depth. But I'm not going to the, the exact story, but to end it, I told her that. Knowing someone's name is so important, especially in America with the melting pot that we have, right? Knowing someone's name is so important, and it is the first step to humanize someone when you meet them. Because we all gonna say, when somebody say, who are you? My name is Cedric Chambers. My name is such and such. And so I told her that it's so important that when you go to prison or you go to jail, one of the first things they do to dehumanize you is they take away your name and they give you a number. And so I'm, I try to, you know, trying to get to her this idea of humanizing. So that's one. The second one is, met this individual, very, very smart individual. I invited him to a networking event. We was having a networking event with a client that we had. He came in the room, and probably a little bit bigger than this, and he stayed in the back of the room the entire time. He didn't talk to anyone, he didn't say anything. He stayed in the back of the room the entire time. As I started to notice this, I went to the back of the room, I said, you know, hey, how's everything going? What's, 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 what's going on? You don't want to engage? He says, you know, yeah, I really do want to engage, but the organization only allows 3.0 as a minimum, and I have a 2.7. And so I'm thinking for a second, because this individual was a mechanical engineer, very smart, had did two internships before with the same company to where they develop medical device um, uh, surgical equipment to where it was used on terminally ill patients. And he has a website, I can give you the website, great, you can see it, how it worked and everything. And so I'm just thinking in my head, like how can somebody this smart, this intelligent, with all this they have to bring diverse, not be included, or not be, you know, think of themselves automatically as being excluded from this situation because they don't meet the minimum qualifications. And so then I want to ask him, 
So tell me a little bit about the 2-7. He says, he's at a top tech school. Not only am I going to school full-time mechanical engineering, but I also work 20 hours part-time to help my family pay for bills. So when he goes to class, he's tired, he's drawn out, just everything. And so, needless to say, it's funny how minimum qualifications work sometimes. <laughs> uh, needless to say, you know, we work with the individual, and we ended up not only getting him a internship with the organization, but then we also work with the, org the school to get him a work study so that he could work in the department that he was in to continue to build that knowledge, but then also still make the needs that he needs for his personal family. I see all that to say, Jump Recruits is a diversity recruitment startup. Our ultimate goal is to increase the diversity representation in your company, build strategies, and execute on strategies that increase retention and engagement, and place, prepare and place diverse individuals in companies in deserving careers. The last thing I'm going to say is this. We all heard the saying, excuse me, we all heard the saying, uh, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You know, teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. What we do at Jump, it would take it one step further to where every candidate we work with, every company we work with, we say this motto of give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, feed him for a lifetime. But if you show him how to buy the pond, his family will never struggle again. And so that's what we do with candidates is if they jump all in with us, we show them how to buy the pond through their careers and through their purpose. And then we give great talent to organizations that are there that are for the long haul for them to go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Caitlin Stack Whitney. I am in the STS department, that stands for Science, Technology, and Society at the Rochester Institute of Technology. It is one of the largest private universities in the US. It has about 18,000 undergraduates. And 2,000 of our students are deaf or hard of hearing. So a lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is really thinking about accessibility as one of the angles of diversity and inclusion we need to talk about. I saw some great stickers out there that say, uh, Disability is part of uh, thinking about diversity and inclusion, so I fully support that sticker, whoever brought it. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do. Um, I'm not sure everybody else's positionality in their career on the panel or in the room, but I'm a very recent PhD graduate, and I'm starting a tenure track position in the fall. And so part of my positionality in engaging this work is recognizing that there are things that I can do as a harmless looking young white woman, but also recognizing that I often don't have as much power in particular institutions and thinking about the points of leverage that I can engage in that space. So the university that I work at has this unique aspect of having over a tenth of our students have sensory disabilities, more than that actually when we count other students. And in general, deaf and hard of hearing students are one tenth of one percent of the population. And globally, people with disabilities are roughly maybe 20 percent to one third of the population. So a lot of the work that I do is really focused on helping people who are teaching and mentoring students and colleagues with disabilities to get out of their way or be better mentors to them. It's not about thinking about individual disabilities as having a deficit or needing us to foster them. Uh, I wrote down what Dr. Finney said about communities need to see working with you as a privilege. So working with all of my students and collaborators is an enormous privilege. And so it's thinking about how do we foster that mindset in my colleagues, in my department, in the people above me. It is an enormous privilege to work with the students I work with. And that needs to be the starting point of thinking about what, do, what am I going to learn from them, but also not in an extractive way, right? When I was first asked to be part of this panel, I was like, oh, I shouldn't be the person sitting here because I'm generally part of teams that are doing this work and they very much include disabled scientists of all kinds of identities. But they're exhausted from being on panels like this, right? <laughs> so part of it is recognizing this tension that especially in disability spaces, we refer to as nothing about us without us, which refers to making sure that work about people with disabilities is led by people with disabilities. But the tension there is that it's not the responsibility 
of people with disabilities to make accessibility happen. And so that is intention. So m all of the work I do is in teams. And I want that to be very clear because I'm talking to you, but I'm parts of teams that do this work together. I'm part of an HHMI inclusive excellence program at my university, and I'm a mentor in both the research and teaching programs there. And I'm part of a unique program that's funded by the National Institutes of Health called RISE. There's different programs across the university. Ours is the only one that's focused on mentoring disabled scientists, and I mentor students who are deaf and hard of hearing in bioinformatics and ecoinformatics. Um, the other thing I want to say in terms of thinking about this, many of us who sit here are thinking maybe with adults or university students, so if there's still adults, maybe in the K-12 space, but a lot of the work that I do outside of my normal responsibilities as a faculty member are really focused on age zero to three. And that might sound very strange to you, but especially, again, when we talk about in the disability advocacy space, there's something called the school to prison pipeline. Maybe some of you have heard of that. And it refers to, um, this intersectional pressure that's on especially children of color with disabilities that routes them to basically not the places that we want them to be, not the places they deserve to be because they are basically experience uh, punishments and not the same opportunities. And it starts from birth. I want to be very clear about that. So as a professional, when I decided where do I put my outreach efforts, where do I put my community engagement, it starts literally from the point that they're born, because I do not believe starting that work at the university level or the K-12 level is enough. And so there are multiple points of engagement to think about. And babies are very, very cute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So um, Dr. Finney also mentioned talking about affinity space. And one of the things I want to be really clear about is the two programs that I work on, one of which is focused on thinking about uh, faculty and basically how do we train them to be a be better mentors for all of our students and all of their identities, while also recognizing that they shouldn't be practicing on our students, right? We want to get them up to speed to be good mentors before you go put a student in their lab space. So this, the programs we have that are putting students in particular lab groups, we want to know that those are supportive spaces of them. And visual representation of people who look like our students, especially if they have a visible disability, is so, so critical. So thinking about how do we grow that, but also not putting that responsibility on saying, oh, you're a disabled student, and there's a disabled mentor, and so you're going to go work with them. Because the reality is that 2 thirds to 80% of the world is not disabled, and it's on all of us to do the work to make sure that we are doing the work and are better mentors and collaborators to our students and our colleagues. So I will stop there. Great, thank you, good morning. My name's Clyde Chrisman, and I identify as an old white guy. <laughs> and I think it's sort of interesting because uh, one of the reasons I'm here is, is it's sort of cool to feel what it feels like to be a minority in the room. And as I look around the room, I acknowledge that as an old white guy, I'm a minority. But let me talk to you a little bit more about why I'm here. Um, I'm the director of a uh, state agency that employs about 450 full-time employees and somewhere between 16 and 1,800 part-time employees. So I have over 2,000 employees. We are constantly hiring. We operate 38 state parks, soon to be 40 state parks. We're two under construction now. So we're going to be hiring some new staff to staff those parks in the near future. Uh, we operate 63 natural area preserves, and we have one of the internationally recognized natural heritage programs. We have some of the best scientists in the fields of biology, botany, and a lot of the pure sciences um, in the country. Uh, we operate uh, our floodplain management and dam safety program. We regulate over 2,000 dams in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's the one thing that keeps me up at night. We've had more dam failures in Virginia in the last year than we've had in the last decade. Um, we office, we offer, op, operate the Office of Land Conservation, uh, our Planning and Recreational Resources Division, our Design and Construction Division that does the uh, building of our facilities in our state parks. And I am here because I have been the director of this agency now going on, uh, I've completed my fifth year, starting on my sixth year, 36 years I've been in Virginia State Government. And <clears throat> five years ago I started on an effort to better diversify my workforce, our workforce. And I'm here to tell you that despite some really robust initiatives, we've made no progress. As a matter of fact, if anything, we've gone backwards a little bit. So let me just give you a couple statistics. First of all, Virginia is about 51% female. My workforce is 63% male. 
Virginia is about 62% white, and I will tell you that that number is going down. Uh, just a few years ago, it was about 66% white. We're at 62% white. Anybody want to guess what percentage of my workforce is white? Throw out a guess. 75, I wish it was 75. 90, you're really close, 93. And that's despite five years of what can we do better. Uh, the, the population of Virginia is about 20% black, about 7% Hispanic, Hispanic, about 3% Asian. Um, again, our total minority population in my workforce is just a little over 7%. So we definitely are not uh, representing the, the constituents that we serve. And again, it's frustrating because we've done a lot of efforts. Um, as a matter of fact, two years ago, we started on our DCR diversity and inclusion, inclusion initiative. And interestingly enough, that was to focus around people with disabilities. Our governor issued an order back in 2017, then Governor McAuliffe, and said each agency had to, was tasked with developing and implementing and evaluating an annual plan around getting more individuals with diversity into the Virginia state government. Well, it didn't take us long to, to figure out that diversity is just a subset of other underrepresented populations. And so we decided to make it a much broader effort uh, to focus certainly focusing on things we could do to, to attract folks with disabilities, but also focusing on how we could, how we could better attract all un, uh, unrepresented groups. So we sort of came up with three objectives. Objective number one was how do we attract a robust, a, a ro robust and diverse applicant pool? Five years ago, I promoted the first division director. We have seven division directors in my agency. I promoted the first African-American division director, thinking that would be a positive step. Thinking about one of the bullets that was on that slide that was up there for a while. After a couple of years, my African American division director hadn't hired anybody of color. He had hired several people. I went to him and said, "What's up with this?" I thought that me, and he said, "You know what? Every when we get in these applicant pools, they're all white, mostly white males." And so coming up with a way that we need to work to attract more robust and a more diverse applicant pool, and I think that starts with working with folks in K-12 and certainly in higher ed. And we've been, and, and I hopefully have the chance to talk a little bit more about that. Of course, the, the second step of, the, of, of, of attracting is then recruiting that, that workforce. But then an important thing is retaining. And uh, one of the things that I've really worked hard personally myself to understand is the difference between diversity and inclusion. And that is something that we worked hard to do um, in terms of creating an environment where we get good people and then they leave after a couple of years. Well, why are they leaving after a couple of years? Obviously, it's not the right fit for them. Why is it not the right fit? And that's one of the things that we're continuing to look inward at ourselves uh, as, as we speak here today. Um, we have, have made some great strides and I think that and one of the things that Carolyn said earlier, and we had Carolyn speak at our land conservation conference in Williamsburg, Virginia, two years ago. It was a great message to hear. Um, but one of the things I think is that, that that she made a good point and that I need to understand that because I do lose my patience in that it is going to take time. We're changing, particularly in a state like Virginia, uh, we're changing longstanding institutional bias. And it takes a long time just to recognize that, let alone come up with uh, affirmative strategies to address it. So well, I'll stop there and look forward to being able to answer some questions. Okay, thank you. So hopefully you have a sense of uh, all of the different places that our panelists are coming from. And I I'm gonna start off with a, a seed question um, and then uh, we'll go through some Q&A from the audience itself. Uh, we'll, we'll throw the thing around or, or something, maybe not throw it, carefully pass it. <laughs> um, so just uh, to get us started, <laughs> we'll demonstrate. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, just to get us started, um, I, I want you to think about you know, some of the things that you all have really learned about this kind of hard work. Um, and what were some of the impactful experiences um, in terms of not just things that happened to you that you observed, but change that you felt a part of creating or failed at creating that you took home a lesson about why? Um, 
And instead of just sort of picking first, I'll, I'll sort of go to the person that has that maybe experience ready to share. Um, I don't want to contextualize it only in successes, even though we would love to share successes, but some of the things we learn are, are through our failures. Um, so yeah, think about one experience to share uh, with the audience. Say it one more time. So think about a success or failure of your initiatives in doing this work that you really took something from. You learned it's going to impact the way you do things in the future. I'll take a first crack at it. Um, you know, I, uh, in my work, I, I, I look at leadership because I really think leadership matters. And in my, in my work with leaders of organizations that want to work more effectively with American Indian people and cultures, um, changing the social institution is very difficult. That's what I learned right off the bat. You know, change is hard. And uh, in, in our, I guess, in, from my community in, in South Dakota, you know, there is, I didn't realize, I didn't realize sort of the, the, the embeddedness of uh, these values, you know, from our community, and how you look at it from a, you know, from a everyday perspective, and you think that, you know, well, they understand we're here, uh, we're not going nowhere, you know, let's figure out how to work better together, but it's it's hard, and and also look at it from the leadership perspective. So, you know, guiding change is is difficult. One of the hardest challenges for a leader is guiding change. And so what we try to do is, is figure out how to work with leaders um, in terms of uh, relationships, um, giving, um, I guess, strategic and helpful feedback as we talk about issues. And, you know, you can't control it. You can't control instances. You know, people will do what they do. And so in some ways, we go one step forward, two steps forward, and then we go one step back or two steps back. And how do you can't control that? And I'll, I'll give you one example. So I'm in South Dakota, and so you know we're working on this reconcil reconciliation between American Indian people and and the non-native people. Have you guys ever heard of DAPL, Dakota Access Pipeline? Well, that's my people that started that. And so we have another one that's coming along called the Keystone XL Pipeline that's starting up this summer. So there there are those of us who are these boundary warriors. They're trying to figure out how to move forward on these kind of things in a positive way. And they're saying, you know, what's gonna, this is going to take us again because the governor is saying, you know, there's no outside money to help support the protesters. She's passing laws. ACLU is getting involved in suing the state because of that. So you can just see how, boy, how that get convoluted, gets complex very fast. And yet there are those of us who are working day in, day out trying to, trying to bridge this understanding. So I keep going back to the fact that American Indian people are the least understood and the mis most mis most understood. And that wasn't my term. That's John Kennedy in was 1967. So we still have to do a lot of work yet. Oh, I go. I go. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, happened early in the career, <laughs> real fast, glad it happened, was that. Um, I came into situations early with uh, the one thing that I tell people now to never do, um, and that's assume. Um, and when coming in and working with organizations who talked about DNI, who talked about inclusion, who talked about what they wanted to do, and going in and assuming that those same individuals cared about what needed to happen, the people that were going to be affected, X, Y, and Z, I found out really fast that that wasn't the case. And I found out really fast, which is the, the, the sad part, is that companies will pay a lot of money to go around and put these diversity initi initiatives in, say that they're doing all these X, Y, and Z things to get on the next human capital rights report or however it may be, um, and then turn around and when it's time to actually do the work, don't want to put their hands to the plow and get it done. And so coming in for me, you know, that assuming piece made me go into situations to where you're hopeful, you're inspiring, you're talking to employees, you're talking to people in the organization saying, These are, this is what we're trying to do, this is what leadership is trying to do, and then go back to leadership with a plan, this is how we need to execute, and then they say, well, we'll push that off to Q4, 
or we'll push it off into 2020 or however it may be. And so that created for me, because like I said, it is a very emotional piece because a lot of this is personal around what I do and why I do do it. Um, so coming in and assuming is one thing that wasn't very successful because what happens is you're bumping heads with the company or with the individuals that you need to ultimately to move forward. And you're starting off on two different planes to begin with, right? And you can never get anywhere if both people don't see the problem the same way. And so that's one of the things I would say from a, like a failure piece I realized early on is that when you come into situations assuming that the other person has the right intent or you assume that they're looking at it from the same viewpoint as you are, it's going to bite you at the end of the day. And so when you're coming into these situations, the, the one thing we, we talk about and we realize right up the gate is what's the appetite? And before I come in and work with your organization, I need to know what you've done. Because if you haven't done anything up until this point, it's a reason why you haven't done anything up until this point. <laughs> so, and I can't be the savior to come in and say, you know, hey, look, we're finna make this change happen, do this and do X, Y, and Z, because I can only assist what goes on. So I think that assuming piece, I would say, is a big piece that prevented a lot of, or caused a lot of failure. Um, but yeah. I think that I'll continue on the assumption as a kind of failure thread, um, and I want to talk specifically in terms of thinking about disability and accessibility about um, the assumption that accessibility is for disabled people and not for everyone. And, and I mean this in two very specific ways. Uh, so I work often with a lot of people who use American Sign Language as their primary language. And so the assumption for many people who work with an individual who, if they speak English, and someone else is an ASL user as their primary language, they say, oh, we need an interpreter, and it's for my ASL using student, or it's for my ASL using colleague. No, it's for you as an English speaker so that you can understand all the knowledge and the contributions of your colleague, right? So that assumption, that framing is a failure. And that framing is what's called accommodations. Accommodations is a deficit mindset. It is in and of itself a failure. It presumes that the disabled person is going to be welcome to the table, but they're lesser than and need to get up to speed, and not that we need to do the work to make the space accessible. Now, when we say though accessibility benefits everyone, one of the failures in the assumption is that it must benefit everyone. So one of the challenges, for example, of working with communities where a very few people have the disability, whatever the disability is, is people can write it off and say, well, nobody needs that, or only one person needs that. Are we really gonna do all of that work for that one person, for those few people? So I can give you the example of captioning. A lot of times now when we talk about captioning, people will say, oh, well, it benefits all these other people. And that is well and good, but that, you should not be doing it because of all the able people that it benefits also. That's a byproduct. You shouldn't have to justify all the abled people that it benefits in order for it to be worth doing your time to create that space. So I'll pick up on, uh, I'm sort of a simple guy and I always look for simple solutions. And I guess one of the things that, uh, that I find challenging about this issue of diversity and inclusion is that there is no simple solution. But I'll give you an example of something we tried that didn't work. There are several of our parks, particularly in the Northern Virginia area, where we have very large Hispanic populations. They love our, love our parks, come in large groups, have large picnics, and we were having some law enforcement challenges that were probably centered around the inability to communicate effectively with folks, things that could be relatively minor, such as uh, you need to put that beer in a plastic cup so we can't see it, those kinds of things. I don't, any, anyway, so we decided, and about 110 of our folks are sworn law enforcement, um, so we decided that we would do a special recruit where one of the preferred re requirements uh, for the job was fluent in Spanish. Um, I wanted to make it a mandatory requirement, but my HR people told me that would be reverse discrimination. I don't quite understand that because I didn't say what race you had to be. I just said you had to be fluent in Spanish, but nonetheless. Um, so we went through this uh, interview process and um, we had a Hispanic who was obviously very fluent in Spanish on the panel. And we got you know, partway through the interview and all of a sudden we changed the interview to Spanish. Now, in order to get an interview, you had to check the box, fluent in Spanish. And one of the scenarios was, the uh, woman said in Spanish, my son is drowning in the river, I need you to come help right away. Not one of the applicants, not one, could respond appropriately. So, I just offer that up as to say 
I thought it was pretty simple. It wasn't because we need to do more where we need to start recruiting folks at a much earlier age. Now, the other challenge with that is I pay, I start out at Park Ranger at a whopping $36,000 a year and finding folks that have special skills that want to come work for that kind of a salary is also a challenge. So that just throw that out because that is one of the many factors uh, that makes this all more complicated than we'd like it to be. I've been thinking about what to say. Um, I, w I want to try and kind of talk about it both sides. So I, I think if on a failure side of things, um, one, one of my colleagues likes to lament what she refers to as the weaponization of diversity, equity, and inclusion, which means it's in marketing. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's a PR thing, it's a marketing thing, uh, you know, they're using it as part of their talent strategy, but it, it's not, there's no real rubber hitting the road on the inside. Um, so I think that's a, a big risk and a frequent failure. I think one of the reasons that that happens is that the folks who have the most power, the folks at the top, are not bought in. Um, typically, the people in organizations who really are bought in and care a lot, you know, and want your help um, are calling on you because they need your support to convince the person with the power to put some resources behind this and that it's something that matters. Um, and, you know, to just reference earlier um, what Carolyn Finney was speaking about with stories, I think that is really, really important. Um, one of, I guess, my personal successes has just been about being able to tell a story so that a white male executive can see his role in advancing diversity and inclusion at his company. Um, just, I, I just want to emphasize that it is so often what I want to do is come in and like help people figure out, okay, what do they need to be do? How are they going to measure it? You know, like what are our criteria for success? But then I realize I can't do that because first I have to reconvince all the people who are in charge that this is what they should be doing. So uh, I guess that's like a failure slash success is that I'm, I always think I can be done having that conversation and I never can. So um, if you can have, but it, that being said, if you can have that conversation in a way that makes a connection that gets kind of a click moment from the person who has the most power, the you know people who really are at the top and are the gatekeepers and uh, have the power of the purse, that is really, uh, really make or break.